praise the Lord. Our God, who are in heaven, we come before you tonight in the name of Jesus. We humble ourselves to ask you for forgiveness for all our sin. Lord, we come to you with all our weakness, with, with all our sin. We ask you to take away all our sin before you, Lord. Lord, we come before you tonight in the name of Jesus Christ who died on the cross for us to praise you, to worship you tonight together even though we are not uh, in the same country but you know uh, we are all by spirit. We are your children. Lord, you come for you came to die for us. You sent your son to die for all of us who recognize you and we become your child. Lord, we come before you tonight. In the almighty name of Jesus, all the churches who gather together tonight to praise you at Massachusetts in this service tonight. All the pastors. In the name of Jesus, Amen.
loving God, I pray for all whose brains have been hurt by disease, injury, stress, trauma, and other factors of human life in a hard world. I pray for all who love them and want to help. I pray for your comfort in their grief, hope amid loss, and the balm of community with people who understand. For people with mental illness, may they find hope in you and feel your longing for them. For parents of children with mental illness, may they know the limits of their power both to cause and to cure. For children of parents with mental illness, may they know you as loving parent and find places where they can grow up in safety no matter how old they are. For friends of suffering people, may they resist the temptation to try to fix their friends and recognize the simple power of their loving presence. For spiritual leaders, may they deny both helplessness and overconfidence courageously serving as first responders and faithful shepherds. For people who need treatment and don't receive it, may they recognize their need, believe life can be better, and find people who can help. For those burdened by shame and stigma, may they walk into the light and find compassionate people. Lord, I pray for light in the darkness tonight. I pray that people with vulnerable minds will find hope and help among followers of Christ who will love them and point them toward what they need while letting them live with that need. I pray tonight for acceptance and grace, the same kind of grace you offer so freely to all. I pray that many churches will embrace the opportunity for messy and sometimes thankless ministry among the marginalized. I pray all of this in the name of the one whose love knows no margins, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Thank you so much for coming, everybody. Again, I would recommend that you switch your view to the uh, speaker view for the remainder of the, the time that we're together. At one point, I know we'll go into breakout rooms. You'll be able to uh, share uh, with a uh, uh, two or three other individuals. This evening's speaker is Reverend Andy Stinson. He was born in Maine and attended Maine public schools. I believe he says he's an 11th generation Mainer. I could be wrong. I could get the number off a little bit. Uh, he uh, comes from mid-coast Maine. He has deep roots to the coast uh, and to the Pine Tree State. Andy's a proud veteran having served active duty with the Surface Deployment and Distribution Command in Fort Eustis, Virginia, and served for four years, ministering to mobilized reserve soldiers and Department of Army civilians throughout the United States. His service at the Surface Deployment and Distribution Command in Fort Eustis, Virginia, earned him one Army Achievement Medal, two awards of the Meritorious Service Medal, and acceptance into the Order of St. Christopher. He also answered the call with the 804th Medical Brigade serving in Baghdad, Iraq, in a time of war. As the senior medical chaplain in Iraq with uh, the last medical brigade in, in the country, he supervised and assisted the pastoral care of three hospitals and all medical religious support in the theater. Andy holds Bachelor of Arts in Geography and History from the University of Southern Maine, a Master of Divinity from the Andover Newton Theological School and the Swedenborg School of Religion. He was ordained in the Swedenborgian Church in 1999. He has served churches in East Bridgewater, Mass., Washington, D.C., Rockland, Maine, and is currently the senior minister of the First Congregational Church of Fall River. He's married to his wife, Kristen, and has two sons, Derek, 27, and Ryan, 11, and two grandchildren and a dog. Thank you, Andy, and welcome. I just said the dog may be the most recommending thing in the whole pros prospect for me. So there you go. thank you, John. That's really kind. Uh, we're, it's, uh, I, it's my pleasure to be able to talk to today about uh, this uh, subject that's not only dear to my heart, but is uh, a part of this journey for us uh, in these days of this, the notion of healing of mind and, and through the lens of the Gerasene 
demoniac. And this this uh, story, this pericope, to use the theological term that comes that in the fifth chapter of Mark. So I want to talk to tonight uh, about the Gerasene demoniac and this notion of what what healing of the mind can mean in some of this. Uh, and I, I think there's a this is a deep uh, pro, this is a deep journey. Um, so, uh, and there's a lot here. So, uh, my goal is that we're going to spend a little time with the scripture and then, uh, we'll have a breakout as kind of reacting to that scripture and, and have you uh, have a quick chance to kind of share just the hearing of the story and the effect of that. And then we're going to kind of dig into it a little bit and we'll take some questions and answers towards the end. So I just want to begin our journey with, by, um, by, uh, the, um, by just reading the text so that you can hear this, uh, this text. And uh, um, so this is from the fifth chapter. This is the New Revised Standard Version. Uh, they came to the other side of the sea, to this country of the Gerasenes. And when he had stepped out of the boat, immediately a man out of the tombs with an unclean spirit met him. He lived among the tombs and no one could restrain him anymore, even with a chain for he had often been restrained with shackles and chains, but the chains he wrenched apart and the shackles he broke in pieces. No one had the strength to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs on the mountains, he was always howling and bruising himself with stones. And when he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and bowed down before him. And he shouted at the top of his voice, what have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I, I implore you, by God, do not torment me. For he said to him, come out, of, come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And then Jesus asked him, what is your name? And he replied, my name is Legion, for we are many. And he begged him earnestly not to send him out of the country. And now they, there on the hillside, a great herd of swine was feeding, and the unclean spirits begged him, send us into the swine, let us enter them. And he gave them permission, and the unclean spirits came out and entered the swine in the herd, and numbering about 2,000 rushed down the steep bank into the sea and were drowned in the sea. The swine herds ran off and told it in, in the city, in the country. And then people came to see what it was that had happened. And they came to see Jesus uh, and saw the demoniac sitting there, clothed in his right mind. The very man who had the legion, they were afraid. And those who had seen what had happened to the demoniac and to the swine reported it. And then they began to beg Jesus to leave their neighborhood. And he, as he was getting into the boat and the man who had been possessed by demons begged him that he might be with him. But Jesus refused and said to him, go home to your friends, tell them how much the Lord has done for you and what mercy he has shown you. And he went away and began to proclaim the in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And everyone was amazed. Okay, so now you've heard that, you heard me read that story. So now I want to offer you the opportunity to watch this story in a different way. That, that the translation I gave you is a very scholarly translation, the New Revised Standard Version. Uh, the, this is called the Amplified Translation. Now, this is a kind of, this is gonna be kind of campy. Uh, it's gonna be, it's an animated version. I, I chose it specifically for that because I believe that there's a um, it, that uh, there's a way that we, it can get kind of uh, the exaggerated notions of what this text is like. So, so if you're like a theater person or you're a production person, just set that aside for me a second and just and just roll with this and and let it and let it have an experience over because what we're going to do after this is then we're going to go right to breakouts and you'll get the opportunity and I, I want you to just. What did you notice out of these? What, what jumped out at you? What effect maybe touched your heart? What maybe there was something you noticed intellectually? Maybe there was something that you didn't understand. Um, so well, it'll be a very quick breakout session. It'll be, it'll be about four minutes and we're, we'll break out by four. So each person will get a minute. So I hope what you'll do is you'll have the opportunity to kind of just introduce yourself, kind of say who you are, where you come from, and then uh, have the opportunity to, to kind of say, you know, out of this, out of the hearing and seeing these texts, this is what this is what I, I came came out of this. And uh, 
I think it's a way, it's a way for us to prep the ground about our, the rest of our conversation. All right. So they arrived at the other side of the lake in the land of the Gerasenes. Just as Jesus was climbing from the boat, a man possessed by an evil spirit ran out from a cemetery to meet him. This man lived among the tombs and could not be restrained, even with the chain. Whenever he was put into chains and shackles, as he often was, he snapped the chains from his wrist and smashed the shackles. No one was strong enough to control him. All day long and throughout the night, he would wander among the tombs and in the hills, screaming and hitting himself with stones. When Jesus was still some distance away, the man saw him. He ran to meet Jesus and fell down before him. Come out of the man, you evil spirit. He gave a terrible scream, shrieking. Why are you bothering me, Jesus, son of the most high God? For God's sake, don't torture me. What is your name? Legion, because there are many of us here inside this man. Then the spirits begged him again and again not to send them to some distant place. There happened to be a large herd of pigs feeding on the hillside nearby. Send us into those pigs! The evil spirits begged. Jesus gave them permission. So the evil spirits came out of the man and entered the pigs. And the entire herd of 2,000 pigs plunged down the steep hillside into the lake where they were drowned. The herdsmen fled to the nearby city and the surrounding countryside, spreading the news as they ran. Everyone rushed out to see for themselves. A crowd soon gathered around Jesus, but they were frightened when they saw the man who had been demon-possessed. For he was sitting there, fully clothed and perfectly sane. Those who had seen what happened to the man and to the pigs told everyone about it. And the crowd began pleading with Jesus to go away and leave them alone. When Jesus got back into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go too. But Jesus said, No, go home to your friends and tell them what wonderful things the Lord has done for you and how merciful he has been. So the man started off to visit the ten towns of that region and began to tell everyone about the great things Jesus had done for him. And everyone was amazed at what he told them. Some, we talked a little bit here about a few of the things that uh, people were uh, encountered. You know, a few questions like, "What's up with the pigs? Uh, how did he know that? Uh, how did he, how did Jesus know that? Uh, how did the Gerasene demoniac know it was Jesus? Did he know it was Jesus? How did how did that? Um, you know, that that the Gerasene demoniac was working towards his own kind of salvation by running towards Jesus. There's so there's some things that jumped out jump out of you of the story. So. The first thing I want to do is look at the larger context of the Gospels that this that uh, you find. All, all three of the Gospels have this story in it. Uh, they're not all the same, but they're but they're very similar. Mark is the most detailed and most exhaustive, uh, and so we have a few differences in the accounts, but but they're not really contrary so much as they are maybe perspectives. So. 
um, we were talking about this. So, but just before this that happens, and, and we'll revisit this later, that it, it, the the disciples are on the boat from Capernaum to uh, Gerasen, and they end up where. Uh, in, in a storm, right? And they end up in that storm. Uh, Jesus is having a nap. They wake Jesus up. Jesus is cranky, but he quiets the winds and the waves. And so the, 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 the last the thing that happens right before this is, who is this man that commands the winds and the waves? So this is the prelude to this, is that they've all been up all night, you know, that, that, the, the, um, that the, the, storm has, the, the storm just passed, and now they come ashore. So on the other side of the storm, they encounter the Gerasene demoniac. Now, the uh, Mark, as a, as a gospel, it was written spe for specific audiences, just like all of the gospels were. Mark was specifically written to Gentile Christians in Rome. So you got to think about this as a particular group of people. So non-Jews that are living in Rome, that, are, that, are, uh, that have been converted from paganism to from the Roman gods and all that to Christianity, uh, maybe by Paul, maybe by somebody along the way, but uh, and then then from that they are they are uh, they're trying to be a Christian community in Rome. So this is this is significant, and Mark is the one that's ministering to them and is is writing down these gospels, trying to trying to create trying to tell the, the story of Jesus in a way that that they can experience the story. Uh, so there is. So as we go along, there's there's this there's this issue of the Decapolis, right? Like there's so what's a Decapolis? Well, the Decapolis is ten cities. Uh, there's there uh, you can see them in purple on the map. Uh, the ten cities uh, from Damascus in the north to Philadelphia in the south, and they come ashore at what is modern day Kersey. Um, which is where this happens. It's the only, uh, scholars are pretty sure this is the spot because it's the only thing that has all the geographical features that this story has with the big cliff and on the water and all these sorts of things. And it's still inhabited today. So the Decapolis is, is an interesting place to begin with because it has, a, it has a, an interesting history. Uh, Pompey goes to war against uh, Julius Caesar in 64 AD in 64 BC. Pompey, uh, but before that, he has conquered a good part of this world, uh, and this was a part that he conquers. He conquers all these cities, and they become kind of protectorates or uh, city states of the Roman Empire. But the Romans don't have a lot to do with it, other than the fact that they pay taxes to Rome. They'll pay their little tithe, but generally the cities run themselves. Now, a few years previous to this, um, that uh, the 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 third what what and they believe is probably the third legion, the legion from Galatia, which is a seventy-year-old le legion. It's one of the oldest and most storied legions in the Roman Empire. Go down there. And because, because the city-states, the ten Decapolis, were getting a little big for their britches, and they weren't uh, towing the line with Rome. So as, it was, as the Romans liked to do, they would send, a, they would send a, a legion down to punish the, the folks that weren't paying the right amount of taxes and, the right, and, and giving the right deference. And so when we encounter this notion of legion that is possessing this man in Gerasim, we already are set up with a very deep entry point to this story because there had been not so many years ago legions that had been over this land and 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 done a lot of damage and a lot of pain and a lot of hurt. Uh, so this is kind of the background of some of that, and and it's the first clue that there's a lot more going on here. Uh, Jesus comes ashore, the demoniac runs towards him, and then legion begs not to be condemned, but is cast out into the pigs. And then the people come out from the town and say, go away. They, 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 they don't want him there. The garrison demoniac and is, his experience is beginning, it, it is a mirror experience to the experience that these Gentile Christians are having in Rome. So think about it. 
that they are that we start out with this that they're you know and, and we, we really have to kind of play the like memory game like you know get you know Phineas T. Whoopi on board and get in the Wayback Machine and kind of think about what this is like but you're a good little pagan in Rome. You're hanging out. You're doing your good little pagan things. You're doing your blood sacrifices. You go visit the temple prostitutes. You go to the Colosseum, watch some people get whacked. You go to the vomitorium. You eat too much. You throw up. You eat more. Yeah, I mean, you know, good times. Like, and then you encounter a disciple of Jesus. Then you encounter somebody, you know, again, maybe Paul, maybe somebody along that, that brings you, that introduces you to this foreigner that kind of crashes onto your shore uh, and that and breaks you free from this death call. I mean, this is what the experience of Rome in this time is really the experience of a death call. Uh, and you can look at the, that the body mutilations, the way that the body is being defiled, the, the do being dominated by a legion. Rome is dominated by a legion right now. There are, there's, there is the, there is the Praetorian guard that runs Rome. There is, there is, um, the you know the demoniac is among the tombs yet this the christian if you think about it, would be isolated in his time that and yet and also there's this sense of repentance that when people come to faith when people come to jesus there's this way in which there's this profound like oh my gosh what have i been doing you know there's this this um particularly as they are lifted out of the death cult and when they encounter a god of love and a God that profoundly loves them, even in their brokenness and sin, and even in all of this. And so we have this, 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 the demoniac begging not to be banished. And yet, and so, and that this experience of the, of the Christian that's living in Rome, whose kind of scales have fallen from their eyes and now has this relationship with Jesus, now sees this part of the death cult they've been a part and, and is seeking repentance. And then the unclean spirit goes into the pigs, right? I mean, this is this, this, it's this way of, it's this symbol of handing back this piggish uh, kind of stuff that's been going on. I mean, we think about the symbol of a pig and, you know, it's dirty and defiled and particularly it's unclean for the Jewish world, but, but that it would go into these, that it would go back to the culture in which it came. It would go back, it would be expelled from him. From, from him. I mean, these are mirror relationships that we're seeing about, and and the, they would see this. So you have to think about like, and Mark was great at this. This is a trick Mark did. Like that, uh, there's a moment in Mark where uh, where he where uh, when Jesus is arrested, and uh, the, there is this little line where, and they there was a young man that they grabbed his tunic, and the and the tunic came off, and he was naked and afraid and ran away. Well, Mark writes himself into the story. Like that's my, all, my, all the scholars kind of think that, well, that's, that's Mark, like saying, this is where I was in the middle of this whole thing. And so you've got this, this moment in which Mark is, uh, is, uh, is writing into, you know, have you ever watched a movie where you're like, you know, somebody that was an extra in the movie? Like, you know, and what do you do the whole movie? You're like watching it. Like, oh, there's Bob, like, there he is, like, you know, like, you're, you're watching the whole time just to make sure, like, you see, and, and they would see themselves in the story. It's like this moment when they get written into the movie. Um, and, uh, and so there's this, there's this be incredible beauty of this, of what this, the ministry to the, to the Gentile Christians that this does, um, you know, the unclean spirits, the legion, which is, you know, uh, again, you know, it naturally translate better as, as unclean spirits. Uh, they cast out this piggish nature. And, and again, and then the, which is the real mystery of all this, you know, where like that they reject the, the guy who gets healed. Like, I think that in some ways, that's the greatest mystery of the whole thing. It's like, this guy's been sick for like 20 years. It don't, wouldn't everybody be like, yes. You know, that's great. Like, what, I mean, don't they love Bob? Like, I mean, what's the matter? Like, sorry, Bob. I, no, but, <laughs> it's this whole notion of where did we go wrong uh, uh, in this? So, you know, and this is, again, and, and I can see the, the it's, it's not hard to imagine the, the Christian Romans being kind of caught in that too. 
Like, you know, you think about it, like, you know, you're, you're good pagan parents, you run, you know, you, you, you raise up your, you know, your mom and dad and you, you, your son, you know, Jimmy has been influenced now by these Jesus people freaks. Like, I mean, we got it like, oh my God, you know? And so, you know, I mean, Jimmy used to be such a good boy. He would go to temple, he would make his sacrifices. He'd come home drenched in blood. He would be, he'd visit the prostitutes two or three times a week. Like it was so good. Like he was so such a good boy and and it, and now what is he doing he's down in the slums taking care of the widows the widows oh my god what are the neighbors going to think you know that where did we go wrong you know this this whole go away instinct that the the early christians in rome would have and so jesus' encounter with legion it mirrors these this christian encounter and maybe, uh, and 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 at the very end, I think you see that um, this this invitation of what God of what Jesus is leaving this little Easter egg that Jesus is leaving for the community in that Mark, as the author, is leaving for the the road for this for these authors is what does the Gerasene demoniac do? He wants to follow Jesus, right? Like, and that, that and that convert in Rome would want to follow Jesus. Like, get me out of this place. And what does Jesus say? No, you stay here in this Roman place, and you go and tell them what what Jesus has done for you, what God has done for you. Oh my goodness, this is this is not okay, uh, and that. And it's this classic setup that we see again and again, not just in Mark's gospel, but in all the gospel in, in this wider world of the classic setup between the empire and the kingdom of God, which is, is not is, and not the messianic kind of empire, kingdom of God that the Israelites were talking about, but this cosmic level uh, overcoming of dominion and avarice, the, the desire to control other people and the desire to have all their stuff. That empire, that empire desire that we all have on board on the inner le level and that is at work in the world on the, on the grand level. That desire and that moment that, come, that, uh, that is, this, is, this, is this battleground of empire and kingdom of God. I think Greg Boyd talks about it best. He's, a theo he's an American theologian. And he wrote a book called God at War. And, and this is his... This is his thought, as he says, for Jesus, healings and exorcisms did not merely symbolize the kingdom of God. They were, they were the kingdom of God. They were not byproducts of the message he was proclaiming. They were the message. Warring against Satan and building the kingdom of God are, for Jesus, one and the same activity. And we can see how this was the same struggle the early Christians had in Rome, that they had converted from paganism, their lifestyle, and they're not only mirroring the experiences of the demoniac in their encounter with Jesus, but they're also living out these healings and exorcisms in their own place and in their own time, warring against a wider culture that would spend about 300 years. I mean, you know, maybe less, but but it wasn't always intense, but, but two to 300 years of trying to scrape them off the face of the planet. Like that's what the Roman empire was doing before the conversion. There were, you know, that, and, and some days it's better, some days it's worse, but they're living in this moment of, of, of a culture that is completely trying to kill them. And what I'm struck by is that it, what it must have been for the like for those early Christians to read and hear the gospel of Mark and particularly this story and come to this place and find themselves in it and to feel the release of the unclean spirit that they had encountered in their own conversion. You know, that, that to, to be to kind of get that amen moment, but also to get to th then and to be in part where the man wants to follow Jesus and I have that, you know, Calgon, take me away moment of like, please, just I don't want to do this anymore. And Jesus and then be recommitted to their ministry in the place in which they were. You know, Jesus, let me follow you out of this Roman world. And Jesus' response, 
go right into the heart of the Decapolis, uh, to go to every one of the 10 cities and tell them what I have done for you. Well, Mark's gospel tells them to stay right there in Rome and to tell their story. Now, I want to pivot to, you know, the, I, one of the be- brilliant things and the beautiful things about scripture is that I believe it is both, it is both, uh, it is holographic in nature. It is both uh, uh, microcosm and macrocosm. It is both uh, microscope and telescope at the same time. We've been looking at this through kind of a big telescope lens, We've kind of been looking back at the early church and looking back, but we, we can also turn this in such a way so that we can look at our, our own experience and our own faith experience in this and our own journeyings right here and right now and examine our own lives through this same lens. I think it's the, the most, I think it's what makes scripture scripture. You know, otherwise it's just a good story, but that, that this, we can take this, you know, this big kind of, you know, pericope story of the, the, and then we can turn it around and we can look at that lens through our own, uh, I look at it through our own experience because our topic is the healing of mind and all of this telescope work, I think also has, comes to tell us about our own battle because I don't think the circumstances are all that different. Uh, in ter- not, and not in terms of there are people out there who are, trying to, who are necessarily trying to kill us, but that, but that we have this way in which we're, we're seeking a, a health and a wholeness of mind, right? I mean, there's anxiety runs rampant. I don't, there, a week has not gone by over the past year that I have not talked to somebody about their anxiety. Half the time it's myself in my own mirror going, <laughs> all right, Andy, keep it together. Like, but, it, but someone has gotten, you know, uh, that because it is so real and that about what it is to be in this, uh, in this place where we have encountered Jesus and then are, are looking to keep our, our mind and, and well and been, and to be freed of, the, of these, these things that would plague us. So now if you remember, in the beginning of this, we came back to a, uh, this moment where, we, uh, where I had how this story began. And it began with this question of who is this that, that even the wind and the waves obey him? This is the question the disciples roll onto the shore with. They've come through a storm. They have this question of, they ask this question, you know, almost they ask it to each other, but they also ask it in this cosmic way of, and the next, what do we, who do we find that answers it? The demon answers this question. That's what's so amazing about the story is that they become, it's not, it's not the other disciples say, well, what do you think? I don't know. I mean, like, it's, it's not the, it's, it's not, uh, the, it's not the healed man that comes back and says, you know, I, I know that you're Jesus. It is Legion him, himself that says, you, what do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? In God's name, don't torture me. Now, that's code. Jesus, son of the most high God, that's, that, you don't hear that a lot of places in scripture. That's code. There was only other one son of the most high God. That was Caesar. Caesar is son of the most high God because Caesar is a demigod overseeing all of the Roman, the, the Roman panoplies. He's considered son of God. If you look at the money of Augustus, it says son of God. Now, Jesus gets called son of God a lot of times but not son of the most high God. And I think this is, this is really at the point of what we're encountering when we encounter this for ourselves on the, on the microscopic level, is that, is that we encounter this, we encounter God, we encounter this, this high treason moment against all of our own anxieties and against all of the things that would oppress us. We commit treason against our worries. We get, commit treason against the things that would push us down and would hold us down, would oppress us, that would extract our resources. You know, think about, like, I, I mean, I think of it like in that same way, 
you know, if you're laying there in bed at three in the morning, just grinding yourself to dust about all the things that are going on in the world and all that, that kind of, that kind of neuroses, that kind of anxiety that we, that, that, uh, that we can so often carry. I mean, those resources that that's sucking off of us, that, that it, it is a great tax from our little empire selves. And so this personal view, you know, and, and we can't go through the whole DSM. So, you know, I, that I, we hopefully, you know, and, and gosh, we would want to, but, uh, but we can, but I, I just want to talk about that sense of like, you know, that, that sense of neuroses that we encounter, you know, that, that, because I feel like that, that anxiety, that powerlessness, that fecklessness, when we go into that, this is, and this is the thing is, this is the invitation is to encounter that. To, to go into it, but we want to run away from it, right? We want to throw a glass of wine and a brownie on it and call it good and not talk about it. But, but when we go into it, when we encounter it, when we purposefully, Jesus goes with us. Jesus shows up. Jesus shows up on the shore. When we go into our anxiety place, when we go into our death place and in going in, and going into that, you know, we, it is our anxiety that tells us, tells us where God is in our life. It is our, it is the legion that tells us what's the most important thing. Like if you think about what you're worrying about, when you think about what you're worrying about, if you really mind that and you turn it on its head, what it will tell you is what your real priorities are. Cause you're probably not worrying about whether you got, you know, uh, um, co you know, uh, you know, sugar Coke or diet Coke in the drive through you know, like you're probably not worried. There's a whole list of things that you're not worrying about. When you encounter the things that you are worrying about, you, it will tell you, these are the things, these are the things that really matter. And when we encounter the things that we really matter and we bring them to, and, and they have the encounter of Jesus, the anxiety goes away. The spirits can be cast out and we can be about the business of living out of the things that we love. And, and I'm not suggesting this is an easy task or this is, this is a, you know, a, a cure-all for all kind of neuroses in the world or anything like that. I'm not, I'm not making that point. But I'm saying what this scripture offers us is, you know, and, and, and the brilliance of it in the way that it, it had a direct word for the church in Rome, you know, 2,000 years ago. And it has a direct word for us right now as well and one of the things and just just by to kind of concretize this a little bit uh, that you find it you know not from jesus but from legion that we get from our anxieties so this invitation from our anxiety to find out what matters to find out what our priorities are and then to and then to be able to bring those priorities and say okay lord help me live those out help me get have that face-to-face -face moment with Jesus. And, and I think for me, those are, that's what the disciplines of the faith are really about. And my favorite, you know, my favorite for this is actually something called centering prayer, which centering prayer is not about asking God for something. It's not about it in the, in the sense of, you know, praying is often transmit or being on transmit to God where centering prayer is much more about listening to God. You know, the, the one of the first, the first folks that came up with centering prayer you know, they were, the, the priest saw this old guy doing centering prayer, and he said, what are you doing? He says, well, I sit here, and I look at God, and God looks at me. And that, I mean, that's what he said the, 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 the image of centering prayer was. And it, and it mirrors often a lot of how the early congregationalists, about how they, uh, they prayed, um, and uh, much of their prayer life. Uh, that, um, and I like this method because it's not about the hokey pokey and doing it the right way. It's not about magic words. It's not about like praying right um, often, I think, because I think when we get our anxieties on board and we get this, you know, there's, we get, you know, we get performance anxiety about like, well, did I say all the right prayers in the right way? Or did, but that it, it's that, that uh, the, it's much more about this, this face to face with our unclean spirits, you know, this just being face to face with our un unclean spirits and that discovering that through our unclean spirits, there's the face of Jesus. G Jesus is looking right back at them. And, uh, and so I really, I, I think that, that uh, this whole passage and this whole journey about healing and health 
is about giving authority back to God. Because if you think about the actual definition, like, like say neuroses, or we could do psychoses too, if you want, uh, that's one's a lot more fun. Um, that, but if we, you know, that we, whatever the, whatever the malady, it is all about misplaced authority. Like if you're, if you're really neurotic about something, it's because you don't believe there's, there's, uh, you don't believe there's an order that's going to hold it together. Like you really, that it's the worry that the wheels are going to come off of everything, that there's no order to this world, that, you know, that door's unlocked and anybody could come through it. Well, anybody could. And that, well, it's going to be a bad person. You know, that, that worry that we, because we, we have this sense that the universe is not friendly, the world is not, is, not, is not okay, and that there is no one in charge. There's no one at the wheel of this, of this journey. And that, um, you know, and I don't want to get into tropes about, you know, just pray harder and stuff like that, because this is, this is difficult stuff and it's complicated stuff. Uh, but I do believe that in these extraordinary times, that, that this notion of, of looking towards God and looking toward the, towards the name of God, looking and without kind of the asking, but with just the, 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 the journeying together is a way to hold our entry into the, the healing of our mind, because it's about putting authority back into the place that it belongs. There's a whole lot of things in this world. This year has taught us anything. There's a whole lot of things in this world we cannot control. And we can help around the edges. We can do these things. But, but that, and that control mechanism is our own empire desire, our own little legionnaire, legionnaires in there that, you know, the third legion, that, you know, the, the third legion was the fighting bulls. Like they were the, they were, um, and they, they were, you know, notoriously mean. And, and we have the ability to take our own fighting balls and be notoriously mean to ourselves, be notoriously, you know, to, to be that, about kind of in that place where we're not doing enough, we're not enough, but to come back and in the world of empires, embrace that uh, this notion of that the, the answer of our unclean spirits, which is Jesus, the son of the most high understanding that there is a most high in this world and we're not it we don't have to be it and we can rest in that we can rest in that and there is peace in that I'm not saying it's easy to do i'm not saying you're going to go home tonight and you're going to be able to you're going to be able to pull all that off but i am saying it is there and it is available and more than anything it's real it is the nature of how the universe is constructed for us so, you know, that great question, who is this that commands the wind and the waves? It's our unclean spirit that can answer that. It's the things that we worry about and the going into our anxieties and that the going into our little legionnaires that would boss us around uh, and, going, and going into our, our pagan and Roman parts and let Jesus, the son of the most high, the most important things in the world, the most important things in the universe, the most important things of God, that, our, that can, can help our minds be right. And then we can exercise our fixations on the empires of the world and embrace Jesus, the son of the most high. And remember Boyd's notion that for Jesus, warring against Satan and building the kingdom of God are for Jesus one in the same activity. So that's, my, that's what I have for tonight. So I know we're a little over time and I, I apologize for some of the technical stuff, but if anybody has any questions, I would love to uh, have a little bit of dialogue before we, before we go maybe. So questions and comments. So Andy, you're suggesting yeah. that, uh, that our anxieties uh, that, that encounter us at three o'clock in the morning are the legion and what they're doing is they're doing a sort of a fire drill for us. And they're helping us to uh, to embrace what it is that we really are concerned with, but we not need not to worry about that because Jesus has power over that. Yeah, yeah just just like just like they were the great messenger in the in the story about to the disciples yeah. to answer their question about who is this guy that the winds and the waves obey him. Just as they were that, just as the legion, the the, the demon legion were there was the messenger of. This is who the most high is. He's the most high. We too can find our own most high. We too can find the living Jesus in us when we're, when we encounter, when we kind of go lean into our anxieties, when we lean into those things that we're worrying about. Because underneath yeah. all the worries are the things that we value. They're the things that we hold dearest in our hearts. 
Uh, they're the things that we, you know, uh, again, we don't worry about, uh, you know, we don't worry about things we don't care about. Uh, well, I don't know, maybe sometimes I do, but, um, you know, that, that largely we're, you know, are at the bottom of the barrel of that, that concern are, are, are our real and honest concerns of, of life. So. Yes, I've been thinking a lot about, um, you know, evil spirits and sort of how they um, sort of weigh upon our minds. And I always think of demons as representing forces that are beyond our control. Um, they might be, I always see them not so much as personal evils, but sort of super personal evils. Um, you know, things that, um, you know, systems or ways of living that sort of take on a life of their own and suddenly you can't stop them, you can't control them. Um, it, nobody wants them to be that way, but it's like this, this, you know, I think sort of like the princes of the air, like Paul would say. And so when I'm sitting in, in, in bed at night and thinking, okay, what is wrong with the world and what can I do to fix it? Um, and I see all these issues that are just beyond my control, beyond my mental capacity to understand, and certainly beyond my expertise to fix. That's when I say I have, well, this is not something that is about me. This is something that is about something that's greater than I am. And that's sort of when I turn to, uh, to Jesus to sort of, you know, take the burden off of me. Because it's only when I do that can I sort of finally get to get any sleep. <laughs> that makes any sense. I like that. That's lovely. Um, I think the thing, one of the things that stuck out to me or struck me the most um, through the whole story was that even though these demons or evil spirits or whatever you want to call them, um, even though they were afraid that Jesus was going to condemn them, they still ran to Jesus and they still knelt down before him and it was almost like they wanted to be helped even though they were afraid. Um, so I was surprised because they knew that he was going to cast them away or what was going to happen. They knew who he was, but they still ran toward him. Um, so that that just stuck out to me that, you know, even though you don't know what's going to happen in life, you can still, you know, run towards Jesus and, you know, you don't know what the outcome is going to be, but we still do that. Yeah, and I, and I think it's kind of a real... It's also a really good image of our lived experience, isn't it? I mean, you know, our anxieties run towards us, like they do. Like, I mean, mine do. You know that they're they're you know they're kind of coming at us, and if we you know in the acknowledging of them, we you know I, I think there's this way in which uh, you know they, but they but they also kind of know the gig is up. You know that there's there's that part of that um, at, that uh, and when it's when it comes in right relationship, yeah, that's really nice. Thanks. Thank you very much for some really stimulating and challenging content tonight, uh, full of, of, of great ideas. And uh, certainly as we march toward Lent, uh, we, we, uh, th this is definitely a, a message that we need to uh, carry with us after this year of COVID and, and uh, this, this time of penitence and uh, preparing ourselves for a, a truly big event that happens uh, at the uh, celebration of the resurrection. So, um, Thanks again, Andy, and I'd like to give you a, a, a round of applause from everybody for thank you all for your preparation. Great on the journey, yeah. Terrific. Let's have a little bit of a prayer as we as we close tonight. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for everyone that was able to come and join in. And we ask that your Holy Spirit would accompany us as we move away from our computers, as we go to our beds, that your Holy Spirit will be with us at three o'clock this morning or whatever time it is that, uh, that these demons seem to uh, run at us with our anxieties, Lord, and know that you have power over death and you have power over our anxieties, Lord God, and we are your blessed children for all good gifts come from you. We put all of our hopes, all of our effort, all of our anxiety and all of our aspirations into your hands, Lord God, that we might be transformed more into your image, that we might do the will that you have uh, uh, expressed for us in this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
Thank you, everyone, and have a wonderful evening. We'll see you next Wednesday. We're with uh, Reverend Curtis Dias next week, and, and uh, he'll be treating us to uh, some more great ideas. So God bless you all, and good night.